Hi there. This video is the second of a series dedicated to my book Blockchain Plus Antitrust The Decentralization Formula. You can access all the chapters following the link in the description. Today, I'd like to tell you about what I call the Blockchain Toolbox. This toolbox addresses all you need to know about blockchain, should you be a social scientist, a government official, or more generally, a non-computer scientist interested in a subject. So let's go. I want to start with commonalities between all blockchains out there. A blockchain is essentially a shared database run by the core software that all blockchain users are using. Those databases have two main characteristics that you need to grasp. First, blockchain relies on encryption. When using a blockchain, for example, to send a token to another user, the real space identity of users does not appear. Only their public key appears. That public key corresponds to the private key they use to sign the transaction. This signature process protects each user identity because one cannot revert a public key into a private one, and even less so, into a real-life identity. On top of that, all transactions are automatically encrypted by the blockchain core software. What comes out of the encryption process is called the hash value. It looks like that. This could mean that I sent you a Bitcoin. Now, behind the scenes, these hash values are grouped before being recorded into the blockchain. Once they are put together, there are different processes for recording these blocks of transactions. All of them rely on encryption and require performing calculations. If the blockchain uses proof of work, computers compete to find what is called a nonce. The most powerful computer will find it first and be chosen to validate the block and get the reward. Each block of transactions is assigned its own hash value. And here's the trick. Each block's hash value is being recorded onto the next block of transactions. Hence the word blockchain, a chain of blocks, all linked by hash values. Allow me one side note here. When I talk about the validation of transactions, it does not mean that someone verifies whether the transaction is legal or that it corresponds to a service that has been rendered. The validation simply means that users exist and that they have not already spent the tokens they are sending. Okay, moving on blockchain's second characteristic. Blockchain is immutable. Immutability is explained by the fact that blockchain is both decentralized and distributed. In a nutshell, decentralization means control while distribution designates the location of the blockchain. Let me explain. Blockchain is decentralized because no single user controls the information or data on the blockchain. This means that no single user can prevent another one from acquiring a token, sending it, etc. This lack of centralized control applies to blockchain developers, courts, and other forms of public intervention. Blockchain is also distributed because its mechanisms and data are located across many computers through the network. For one, the blockchain core software runs on all computers. A handful of users cannot impose updates to the software. Each user needs to agree to update its software. In addition, blockchain users can download a copy of the entire ledger. That explains why blockchain is immutable. Look at what is happening should you want to delete one transaction in your copy of the blockchain. Immediately, the block in which a transaction was is assigned a new hash value. But remember, the original hash value of that block has been recorded into the next block. There is then a mismatch between the new and the original identity of that block, but only in your copy of the blockchain. It is then put away. This is why you can trust the integrity of a blockchain without a centralized power. The more users, the better. This is also why you can use blockchain not only to record what happened in the past, such as retrieving information about a transaction using Bitcoin between two users in 2013, but also to organize the future with certainty. Users can indeed condition transactions to future events, such as buying tokens if the value drops below a certain level, or sending one if it snows. These future transactions are called smart contracts. I will come back to them in a future video. Okay, moving on to blockchain differences. All blockchains are different, but I want here to capture two common discrepancies between them. 
First, blockchains can be public, private, permissionless or permissioned. Access to a blockchain defines whether it is public or private. When a blockchain is public, anyone can access it. On the contrary, users need the proper authorization to access private blockchains. Now, on top of blockchain public or private nature, writing permissions on the ledger defines whether a blockchain is permissioned or permissionless. Blockchains are permissionless when anyone can write on the blockchain and validate blocks. The blockchain is permissioned when only specific users can write on it. Therefore, public blockchains can be permissionless or permissioned, while private blockchains are, by definition, always permissioned. This means that public blockchains can be permissionless or permissioned, while private blockchains are, by definition, always permissioned. Second, and last, I need to discuss blockchain consensus. The consensus of a blockchain materializes in the code run by the blockchain core software that governs the transfer of value between users. Let me start with private blockchains here. Generally, those blockchains run on a consensus that typically gives one or several participants the power to control transactions. Private blockchains are, in a sense, not real blockchains as they feature a clear pilot in the cockpit. I will come back to that point later on. As we speak, most public blockchains, such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, use proof of work to achieve consensus. Proof of work requires users who want to validate transactions to provide computing power to the blockchain to find a nonce and be chosen to validate blocks. I shall also mention that one of the most popular alternatives is the proof of stake mechanism, which is now being implemented on the Ethereum chain. Here, a user's chances to validate blocks increase with the number of tokens the user owns in the blockchain and the duration of possession. The idea is that the more a user has tokens, the more she or he has stakes in the game and will therefore verify transactions properly. The upshot is that these consensus mechanisms attempt to strike the right balance between the network security and scalability. And new mechanisms are constantly being developed to achieve that goal. In all likelihood, tomorrow most commonly used protocol has yet to be created. That is all for today. Thank you very much for listening. Take care of yourself, and if you can, someone else too. Cheers.